morning, everyone. I want to thank you for the privilege of being part of your church service today. I've enjoyed it immensely so far. I love seeing all the innovation that uh, you've put into making your church service so interesting. Um, so thank you again for the privilege of being part of your church family today. Imagine with me, if you will, the thoughts of a certain king. What a mess. How was I supposed to know she would get pregnant? What else could I do? If the kingdom finds out, the penalty for her and for me would be death. Not to mention the humiliation. I just can't bear it. I tried covering it up. Everything would have been just fine if you would have just gone home and slept with his wife. But no, his loyalty to me and the forces of Israel was too great. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As shortly as you live, I will not do such a thing. Oh, what else could I do? I even tried getting him drunk so he would go home. No use. And I might have given the order to send him into the hottest part of the battle, but it wasn't me that killed him. I know. I also gave instructions that the others were to pull out, but it's still not my fault. People are starting to speculate and gossip, but they can't prove a thing. They'll forget about it over time. These may have been some of the thoughts going through King David's mind as he considered his situation and justified his actions. Then the prophet Nathan comes in and exposes everything. What should he do? He was faced with a choice. He could just laugh it off as if it wasn't true. No one would dare pursue such an accusation against the king. He could get angry and yell and outrage that Nathan be put to death for saying such scandalous things about the king. Where would the course of his past decisions take him? Today, we're going to look at the life of David to see that each decision we make, big or small affects the next one, for better or for worse. Each decision on its own may seem insignificant at the time, but it helps to make the next decision easier. Each decision to trust in our own strength and wisdom makes it easier to continue on the road of sin. But each decision to rely in humility upon the power of God makes it easier to do the right thing. Shall we pray? Dear Father, the world teaches us that total independence is something to be proud of. But dear Father, if that independence equals self-reliance, making decisions based totally on human wisdom, then we're in trouble. If we fall for that lie, we're likely to end up in a mess just as ugly as the one that King David found himself in. Dear Father, it would be easy to look back at King David and just shake our heads and talk about what a foolish thing he did. But we are no different. We are subject to the same temptation, temptations and just as likely to fail as he was. Please use the story of King David today to teach us that each decision we make paves the way for the next one whether for better or for worse. You are a God of grace and forgiveness. Thank you that you're willing to forgive us no matter how big a mess we get in. Help us to recognize our sin and like King David, to come to a place of repentance. As with David, the stains of sin often remain, but with sincere repentance, the gift of eternal life also remains. As always, Lord, I thank you for the privilege of speaking to these your saints. And I ask that they will forget every word I say and remember only the message that you have for each one of them. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you. You know, as we've been getting older, we're starting, we've realized we're starting to go to weddings again. 
when you first are in your early 20s, you go to a lot of weddings of your classmates and your friends, and then it seems like it dies off for a while. So now it's like we're going to the weddings of our, of our like our children's weddings, and then the friends of our children, our church children. And you really realize how things have changed from when we got married many years ago. Back then, if you got one bridal shower, that was wonderful. I felt doubly blessed because I happened to get two. My boss at the daycare uh, on the campus of CUC, well, Berman now, threw me a surprise shower, and that was wonderful. And then when we got back to Newfoundland, my church mom held a shower for me too. Now I've learned there is a bridal shower, a bachelorette party, a bachelor party, a rehearsal dinner, and a decorating day. And gone are the days of simple balloons and a few tissue paper flowers. Now, many of you are probably too young to remember sitting there for hours, folding the tissues back and forth, putting the staple in and puffing them up to make carnations. Things are much more complicated. Well, a couple of years ago, I spent at least seven hours ironing tablecloths. It'll be easy, I said. No problem. And truly, I did really appreciate the opportunity to have something to do to help. I just underestimated how long it would take to iron 65 satin tablecloths. With over 200 guests invited and a dinner that was catered for at over $30 a plate, not to mention limo costs, professional photographers, thank you cards, and a rental hall, I learned that weddings can be an expensive and extravagant venture. I feel for all you parents of 20 year olds at this point in time. When the bride told me that she had spent over $10,000 on the wedding, I was a little amazed. When I checked online to see what the average cost of a wedding is these days, I was floored. In 2019, the average cost of a wedding in Canada was nearly $30,000. In 2019, the average cost of a wedding in the U.S. was over $35,000 U.S., and that didn't include the honeymoon. You can buy a really nice car for that. So I started to wonder, with that much money involved, at what point would it be too late to call off the wedding. Technically, until you say, I do, you still have the option of saying no, but with the full weight of the wedding engine behind you, could you really say no by the time you're at the altar? With over a hundred of your family, relatives, and friends there, and all that money spent, can you really still say no? What about at the rehearsal? There's not as many people there, but the expectations are strong at this point that you'll go through with it. And you'd still be out almost the same amount of money. Okay, what about after the invitations have gone out? It would be a little easier, but still very embarrassing. You start to see that you would have to change your mind months in advance if you were really going to be able to change your mind at all. Each step forward makes it harder to change course. As we look at the story of David and Bathsheba, we'll see how one bad choice usually leads to another and another. Now, many people think that the trouble with David and Bathsheba started when he saw her bathing on the roof next door. But if you look at 2 Samuel 3, one to five, it gives us a hint that the problem started even before that. So let's take a look at that passage. So 2 Samuel 3, one to five. I want you to listen closely. Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. 
And unto David were sons born in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoham, the Jezreelitess. His second, Chileab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And the third, Absalom of Mecca, the daughter of Telma, king of Gisher. And the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. And the fifth, Sephatida, the son of Abithal. The sixth, Hetherim, by Egla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. How many wives did you count there? Six! Any man who has had five or six sisters knows he was asking for trouble. If you turn a couple of chapters over to 2 Samuel 5, 13, it says, And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron, and there were yet sons and daughters born to David. He wasn't satisfied with six wives. He wanted more. We know from Genesis that God's plan for marriage was to consist of one man and one wife. David had let his emotions guide his choices instead of relying on God's guidance. Society tells us that more is better, that if I have a lot of something, I will be happier than if I have less of it. Have you ever noticed that the opposite is often true? How many people do you know who have had one vehicle for many years and are content? Now, think how many people you know that have two or three vehicles and still regularly check out the dealership lots. And just in, think, just in case the guys think I'm picking on them, how many of us ladies have a full closet of shoes or towels or linens and still feel ourselves drawn to that section of the store? We don't need any more. Often we don't even have room for any more, but we go anyway, just to look, which often ends up in buying just one more sometimes to give to somebody else in all fairness, but self is never satisfied, but God calls us to be content. David had indulged in this sin and felt confident that this was one area where he could handle, handle it on his own. Giving in to this temptation kept him shopping instead of being content with what he had. Now, there were other bad choices that David made that led to the fix he was in. So in 2 Samuel 11, 1, we see another. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried at Jerusalem. The part that really caught me when I read this first was, it appears that the same way we have a regular harvest season, they had a regular season where kings go forth to do battle. Now we know that the king, that David was a king, and that he was definitely a man of war, because that's why he couldn't build the temple. So what was he doing? Tarrying in Jerusalem. Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 718, Before the conclusion of the war with the Ammonites, David, leaving the conduct of the army to Jacob, returned to Jerusalem. The Syrians had already submitted to Israel, and the complete overthrow of the Ammonites appeared certain. So it appears that it wasn't a matter of David not going to war, as much as the fact that he didn't hang around until the war was over. Either way, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. So verse 2. And it came to pass in an even tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. That means he looked long enough to notice that she was beautiful. The expression, there's no harm in looking, obviously isn't true. 
verse 3. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Hiliam, the wife of Uriah the Huddite? Next mistake. He let himself think about her long enough to send someone to find out who she was. No harm in that, right? At the very least, once he found out that she was married, that should have been a cue to stop. Especially when he found out whose wife she was. You see, Uriah the Huddite wasn't just some random soldier in the king's army. Scripture names Uriah as one of David's 30 mighty men. Now, given the thousands of men who fought for David to be singled out as one of a select few, says that he was well known and respected. In fact, Ellen White refers to him as one of David's trusted officers. David should have stopped there. But alas, the train was already starting to pick up speed. And there was no harm in meeting her, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Verse 4, And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now what was David going to do? He knew that he had done wrong, and instead of to turning to God, instead of turning to God in repentance, he did the only thing that he could think of. He called Uriah home and tried to get him to sleep with his wife. So everyone would think that the child was Uriah's. The only trouble was Uriah wouldn't do it. He was loyal to David, to Israel, to his fellow soldiers. He couldn't imagine how, could, how he could enjoy the pleasures of home when his fellow soldiers were still encamped in the open field. David was a wise man. He knew that there would be dire consequences if his crime became public. The law of God pronounced the adulterer was to be punished by death, and even though custom would have probably protected him from that fate, the proud spirited soldier, so shamefully wronged, might have avenged himself by taking the life of the king or by, or by exciting the nation to a riot. David's wisdom led him to take the next logical step. Keep the crime from becoming public by killing Uriah. Here we're given further proof of the loyalty and trustworthiness of Uriah. David didn't think twice about sending the death warrant with Uriah. The very letter to Joab instructing him to orchestrate Uriah's murder was sent by Uriah. This would have, the other challenge was this would have all had to be done quickly if the plan were to work at all. You see, it would have taken a couple of months for Bathsheba to realize that she was pregnant. Then there was time to fetch Uriah and then send him back. And then, of course, there was the 30 days of mourning before he could do the honorable thing and marry Bathsheba. Even if the events around Uriah's death didn't look suspicious, people would be doing the math and wondering when the baby was born just six months after the wedding. Relying on his own wisdom and strength, David had progressed from accidentally noticing a woman bathing to adultery and murder, not to mention making Joab an accomplice to murder and being responsible for the deaths of the other soldiers that were put purposely in harm's way to make it look legitimate. It's clear from the story of David and Bathsheba that each decision we make bears the weight of all the decisions that were made before. When we make wrong choices, even when they seem small, they have a way of leading to more and bigger wrong choices. For David, it brought him right back to where we started, confronted by the prophet Nathan with a big choice to make in a hurry. If he had reacted, if he, sorry, he had to react quickly to Nathan's accusation, accusation if either ruse was to look credible. Taking too long to laugh or get angry would make it obvious that it was an act. 
but other past decisions of David also came into play. Let's backtrack just a little and look at the reaction, at his reaction, when Nathan tells him the parable about the rich man slaying the poor man's you to serve his guests. His reaction shows the strong sense of justice that he had cultivated all his life. Let's read 2 Samuel 12, verses 5 to 14. We're going to skip a couple in the middle. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he, shall and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. We're actually going to skip down to verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child that is born unto thee shall surely die. David chose to come clean, to humbly admit that he had sinned. Ellen White describes the scene this way on page 722 of Patriarchs and Prophets. The prophet's rebuke touched the heart of David. Conscience was aroused. His guilt appeared in all its enormity. His soul was bowed in penance before God. With trembling lips, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. All wrong done to others reaches back from the injured one to God. David had committed a grievous sin, both against Uriah and Bathsheba, and he keenly felt this but infinitely greater was his sin against God. Though there would be found none in Israel to execute the sentence of death upon the anointed of the Lord, David trembled. Least guilty and unforgiven, he should be cut down by the swift judgment of God. But the message was sent to him by the prophet, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Yet justice must be maintained. The sentence of death was transferred from David to the child of his sin. Thus the king was given opportunity for repentance, while to him the suffering and death of the child as part of his punishment was far more bitter than his own death could have been. You see, up to that point, David had been a man after God's own heart. God was able to forgive David because in numerous choices up to this point, he had cultivated a spirit of repentance and humility. In a similar way that one bad decision leads to another, each good decision leads to another as well. Each time we deny self and follow God's instructions, it makes it easier for us to do it again. Even in little things like building the habit to drink more water. Each time you fill your water bottle and keep it with you, it makes it easier to remember to drink more water and do it again the next day. Each time you catch yourself before you gossip and think of something positive to say about the person instead, it's easier to do it the next time. Each time you forgive someone who wrongs you, it makes it easier to forgive again and frees you from the trap of bitterness. So what makes the difference? Just like in marriage, it depends on who you choose to give your life to. Whether you choose to rely on self and open the door to Satan's leading, or whether you choose to give your life to Jesus and humbly follow his lead. Satan knows that as Christians, we are not going to consciously choose him, even if our relationship with Christ is suffering. He knows too that for most of us, he isn't going to tempt us to rob a bank, steal a car, or commit murder. But it would be fairly easy to tempt us to rely on our own strength to fix the sin problem in our lives. In our lives, That if we just try hard enough, we can be good enough to get into heaven. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 718 says, As soon as Satan can separate the soul from God, 
the only source of strength. He will seek to arouse the unholy desires of man's carnal nature. The work of the enemy is not abrupt. It's not at the outset sudden and startling. It is a secret undermining of the strongholds of principle. It begins in apparently small things, the neglect to be true to God and to rely upon him wholly, the disposition to follow customs and practices of the world. Satan lures us with perceived pleasures and the promise that no one will find out. Experience tells us that just like David, those pleasures are short-lived and scripture tells us there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. Matthew 10, 26. What about Jesus? We saw from the story of David and Bathsheba that he is forgiving. Even on the cross, as he was being put to death for our sins, he prayed for forgiveness of those who were involved in his crucifixion. He offers forgiveness to us as well if we, like David, will willing, are willing to sincerely repent. He left the throne of heaven to come to this earth and live as the poorest of us to show us the way to live. His death on the cross paves the way for us to claim the gift of salvation and live eternally with him in heaven. We are his. By virtue of his role as our creator, and because he died on the cross to buy us back. Still, he gives us the choice as to who we want to serve, self or him. Today, we looked at how a string of decisions, some as small as taking a second look, led David down a very dark path, but how the weight of a lifetime of other good decisions led him to repent. Each time you're faced with a decision that bothers your conscience, even just a little, thank God for the reminder that there is a better way. Ask him to give you the strength to make the right choice and for the strength to turn around and repent if you're already a ways along the wrong road. Ask him to help you choose him. Do you take this man to be your lawfully enthroned savior? live together in holy communion, to love him, to honor him, to keep him as your savior in sickness and in health, forsaking all others for as long as you shall live. I pray that we will all say, I do, as we surrender our will to his one small decision at a time. He longs to take us home. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you today. Mm -hmm.